started here. I'm Carrie Richards. I'm from the Bear Center for Nonprofit Management at Robert Morris University. Thank you so much for joining us today. And today we have Phyllis Hartman, one of my favorite people, um, to bring us uh, a much needed look at HR thoughts and tips um, for nonprofits during COVID-19. And so um, Phyllis has taught many classes for us. She was our team leader for the Ready to Compete HR module. Um, some of you may know her through that. And without further ado, take it away, Phyllis. Good afternoon. Um, I'm pleased to be here this afternoon and share with you some information that I've gathered um, related to how HR um, aspects of your organization might cope with, uh, with the coronavirus. Um, I know I won't disappoint you when I say I don't have all the answers. <laughs> um, I don't, if anybody tells you they have all the answers, run away quickly. Um, I do have some thoughts to share with you today on various aspects. And this is based on a lot of um, information I've been gathering from colleagues, from professionals, and from other organizations. Um, you will, um, if you have questions during the presentation, um, feel free to put them in the chat. You'll see there's a chat button uh, probably down towards the bottom of your screen. Um, I don't know if we will have time to answer questions or to answer all of your questions today, but we'll do our best and we'll try and capture those that we don't have time to answer um, and respond back later. Um, but you will have my email address um, at the end of the presentation and Carrie will be providing you with copies of the slides um, because there are a number of resources and links on the slides that you might want to use later. Um, so feel free to reach out to me by email um, if you have questions later. I'll try and do my best to help you. Um, and again, um, you know, we're all in this together. So if you have ideas to share, that would be uh, welcomed also. Um, this is my legal disclaimer. Um, I am required by my attorney to put this on. Um, I'm not a lawyer. Um, I do know a lot about labor law just because of 30 plus years in HR and doing a lot of study and reading related to, uh, to labor law. Um, but things are changing so quickly, I will tell you honestly, even the uh, best lawyer doesn't have all of the answers and some of the new regulations that have come down the pike because they're untested means there aren't really direct answers. So again, this isn't legal advice, but it is some general information to try and help you um, deal with the COVID crisis that we're all experiencing. Um, we're going to talk, we're, this, this uh, program is in two parts. The first part is going to be talking about immediate HR issues. Um, and the second part will be talking about what we should be doing and thinking about looking to the future. There's some overlap in some of this because there are some things that if you um, have continued to operate as an essential organization or business, you might um, have some things that you're doing now that you will be continuing to do in the future. Um, and some of you who may have had to shut down, down operations and are looking forward to things opening up um, will have things that you'll see in the first part that you should be considering doing going forward. We're gonna talk about staffing, communicating with employees, which is critical right now, um, for a number of reasons, to help keep them with you and to help keep them safe. We're gonna talk about safety in the workplace and how you can potentially structure your workplaces to keep them safe. Or if you're currently, again, um, serving clients or customers, um, if you do have staff working in-house, there are some safety protocols you should be following that we'll touch on a bit. And then we'll talk about record keeping and documentation. Um, many of us are very um, stressed and tied up with everything that's going on here in our environment. And sometimes it's easy to forget that we need to maintain records. Um, and those records will become even more critical going forward. So we'll talk a bit about that in the first part. Okay, first of all, staffing. Um, if you have, um, 
staffing uh, situations where you've had to reduce your, your workforce. For example, if you had to shut down based on the, the governor's uh, regulation and you had to do, you had to take some action, or if you find that you might need to take these actions going forward as um, the need for the, the same number of staff may change as you open up, um, as you um, experience more or fewer um, people to provide services to. So ways of dealing with staffing um, in terms of reducing the number of staff would involve layoffs, furloughs, or possibly reductions in force. And I just want to point out the difference between those um, items. A layoff is typically considered to be most of the time a permanent situation. So if you use that terminology, you may be telling staff, we're laying you off and you may not come back from that layoff. Uh, typically, it ends the employment relationship. A furlough, on the other hand, is a situation where it's like more like a leave. Um, you're not, you're telling the person you're not gonna have them come to work. In most cases, you're not gonna be paying them for that work because they're not working. Um, but it's more like a temporary layoff. Your expectation is you're gonna bring them back. And in many cases, you would, this would be the situation for a lot of, a lot of the organizations and businesses I'm dealing with have done furloughs because they've kept the people listed as employees on their books, um, usually related to providing, continuing to provide them with benefits. So furloughs are temporary, layoffs are typically more permanent. Now people use those terms interchangeably. A reduction is in force is where you lay someone off and potentially eliminate their position and the expectation there is that you don't bring them back at all. Um, now, under any of these conditions, your employees um, might be able to collect unemployment. Um, unemployment has been expanded to cover individuals who are independent contractors. It covers um, organizations that maybe in the past, some religious organizations haven't been required to participate in unemployment. However, under the COVID um, changes, there are uh, there is unemployment available for people for any who have been um, laid off furloughed or terminated from any organization so you may be dealing with unemployment situations where you have never had to do that in the past um, the goal from for a lot of the government programs is to keep everyone employed if possible and you may have been able to do that in your workplace it may be that you're still open and providing services that are uh, critical or necessary and so you're keeping people employed under those conditions there are some situations and we're going to talk a little bit about some of the funding available to organizations where you might keep everyone employed, but they aren't coming to work and doing work. And that's where the uh, Paycheck Protection Program kicks in, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. So you may be trying to keep all your employees with you so that you don't lose them and because you might need them uh, going down the road. You might need to establish flexible work hours, um, staggered shifts, and this situation may be um, may be occurring currently um, because of the volume of work or because you're trying to keep people out of the workplace, um, having them work from home, but needing to have people have come in, have people come in sometimes. So flexible work hours and staggered shifts may be something that you're either doing now or you might want to consider. When you are doing this, when it comes to staggered shifts and flexible work hours, you might want to pay particular attention to those individuals who are considered exempt. Um, typically, people refer to them as salaried employees under the Fair Labor Standards Act. If those flexible work hours or those staggered shifts mean that they are not making the minimum amount of money within a standard work week, it may jeopardize their exempt status. I'm not going to go into details on this, but you, if you need help in this regard, I can provide you with some resources or some, some thoughts. But pay attention to reducing the hours or changing the hours of exempt employees in particular. 
people might be working remotely, and this is the case in, um, I've read recently that I think something like 60 some percent of employers in the US have people working remotely right now. Um, we talked about reduced hours for non-exempt and exempt employees. Now, non-exempt are those individuals paid hourly, they're paid overtime for over 40 in a standard work week, and exempt are individuals that are paid by salary and they're paid the same amount every week. Um, you might also be using leaves. Um, there's some new regulations, some new government regulations that are providing support for employees. The Families First Act is one of those, and that's one that extended family and medical leaves um, for employees. So under the Families First Act, if you have an individual who can't come to work because they are experiencing COVID symptoms and have been diagnosed or under, or under quarantine and being diagnosed, those individuals may be eligible for what's called extended family and medical leave. If your organization had less than 50 employees previously, you may not be familiar with or have used family and medical leave but now you will need to be able to do that for those individuals. So that covers individuals who have the disease or are being diagnosed for the disease. Um, it also covers individuals whose children's schools are shut down and or their daycare centers are not available, that they're closed. So you're operating, you need people to come into work. They can't come because they don't have childcare available. If that's the case, those individuals may then be eligible for this extended family and medical leave. So again, it applies to people who are sick, uh, people who are being diagnosed, people who can't come to work because of schools and childcare being closed. And it also applies for individuals who are caring for someone who is a dependent. So it might be a spouse, it might be a child that they have to stay home and take care of them because they have COVID. The key here is it's all COVID related um, or child care or um, school closing related. Um, again, I'm not gonna go into details on this, but I will provide you with some resources within uh, this program that can help you learn more about those situations. The key with the Families First Act is your business has to be open and would normally have these people coming into work. If your business is closed because of a close order or a shutdown order from the government, you can't, the, the Families First Act doesn't apply to you. Um, there's the CARES Act, which provides uh, expanded unemployment. We talked a little bit about unemployment, but just to give you some details on that, uh, the federal pandemic unemployment compensation is an additional $600 a week in benefits that, that's provided to people who are eligible for and are on unemployment. The pandemic, pandemic emergency unemployment compensation um, is a program that extends all unemployment benefits for up to an additional 13 weeks if people are unemployed. And the pandem pandemic unemployment assistance program provides unemployment benefits to independent contractors, gig workers, and those who are self-employed. So if I were not working as a small business owner, I would be able to collect unemployment possibly under this CARES Act. Okay, that gives you a little bit of uh, coverage on staffing and staffing issues you might be experiencing. Um, the next most important thing that we want to think about when it comes to dealing with uh, COVID is communicating with our employees. Um, and this is critically, it's always critically important to communicate with your employees. Um, any of you that know me know that I uh, believe that keeping an open line with your employees, having a good relationship where they can come to you, you can, uh, you can go to them, that open door approach means that your organization will work more efficiently and your employees will probably work harder. Um, in this case, people are afraid. 
And so it's very important that you communicate with your employees, whether those people become, whether they are coming into work, working remotely, or even if they're not working right now and your expectation is you're gonna bring them back to work at some point, you need to be communicating with them on a regular basis. Um, you need to dispel fear and be honest about things. You don't have to try and be negative, but it's important that people can trust you in terms of working for you now or working for you in the future. So it's best to be honest and try to dispel any fear um, and rumors related to COVID. And what I would suggest is if you're not sure about something, go look on the CDC website, um, go look on the, um, the Institutes of Health website. There's a lot of information out there that you can trust um, as, as accurate as we know it at the moment um, beyond what people might read on Facebook. Um, you want to keep people engaged. Um, and as I said, if people are working from home, this is important, but also if they are not working right now, um, having some kind of regular communication with them. Um, if you're not going to, you're probably not going to want to do this with people who you don't plan on bringing back necessarily, but anyone who might be coming back to work later, you need to make sure that they know they're still connected and you still care about them. Um, you should have something planned to have a regular meeting. It might be once a week. It might be once every couple of weeks, depending on your availability, where you reach out to everyone. And you can, and we'll talk a little bit more about networking platforms. Um, it's really critical that you keep that communication and that engagement going if you expect people to come back and work hard for you later. Um, managing remote workers. Um, many of you may not have experienced having people work remotely before. Um, you have agencies or organizations where everybody comes to the site every day or most of the time, or they go out and visit with clients every day. And now things are totally different. Um, what you want to make sure when you're managing remote workers is that they have the right stuff. Do they have an internet connection? Do they know how to use the computer? Do they have a computer to use? Do they have ways of linking with whatever work you're expecting them to do? Um, again, those regular discussions are important and making sure that you're very clear about what you expect them to do. Um, I have a nonprofit client that early on I was working with and he was gonna have people work from home and he said, but how will I know if they're doing the job? I kind of pointed out to him that he typically doesn't stand in the office over every person and watch everything that they do all the time anyway. <laughs> so the, um, you know, the expectation would be that they are doing the job. And if you let them know what you expect them to be doing, what product or service they're supposed to be producing, what amount of work you expect them to get done, and then you follow up and make sure that they don't have questions and if they've gotten that done, then you know they're working. You have to have to be standing next to them every moment and you don't do that anyway, probably. Um, furloughed employees, again, remember furlough is a little different than layoff. If you've told them they're laid off, but you're treating them as though they're furloughed, that they're still connected, still getting benefits, um, or if they were even laid off and you expect to bring them back, you should again, make sure that you keep regular and factual contact with them. Phyllis, we have um, a question if, that came up about furloughed employees. Yes, and go ahead, Terry. Is, if you're having furloughed staff participate in any company-related meeting, are they entitled to pay under the law? It depends on the classification of the employee. If you are, if you are requiring them to participate in a meeting, then they are working, okay? Um, you, there may be some question about whether it's uh, communication where you're just letting them know the status um, and you, um, you aren't necessarily going to be involved for a long amount of time or you're giving them some, some information. That may be, it may be questionable as to whether you have to pay them. But even if they're furloughed, if you're expecting them to do something, if it's not voluntary, potentially you are having them work. And if they are furloughed and still connected with your organization, you potentially have to pay them if they are 
um, hourly employees if they are non-exempt employees. If they're salaried employees, you're probably already paying them anyway. So unless you've severed the employment relationship and you still are connected with them, yes, you may have to pay. And that's not a legal answer, but it's a yes, maybe answer. Thank you very much, Phyllis. Alrighty, thank you. Um, finally, communicating with people um, to give them emotional support. Um, you're not expected to be a psychologist um, or to solve all, of pe all people's problems. And a lot of people are going through some serious issues with depression and anxiety right now. Those are things that, that you may have a, an organization that provides that kind of support. And if you do, thank you very much. But if you don't and you're not qualified to do that, you want to be careful about giving emotional advice um, or, or advice related to emotional problems. If you have an employee assistance program, this is a great time to remind people that they can take advantage of that and they can use that. In addition, there are a lot of organizations out there right now that are providing that kind of support for people. Um, you can do a quick internet search looking for help related to um, depression and anxiety, and there are some um, some government organizations that have that available too. So look for that. Um, what do you want to communicate? Well, it's critical that when you're communicating with people that you make sure that they understand that we're all working together and you want to have a united voice from leaders. So if you have a number of individuals who might be communicating with employees, say you have an executive director and then you have some managers, and they're all communicating with people at different times or different groups of people, it's really important that you get together as an executive leadership team or as a board and an executive leadership team and decide what you're going to communicate to your employees so that they get uh, consistent and from honest information from you. Um, I emphasized before the frequency of communication is important and uh, the accuracy in terms of what COVID is and what it isn't. Um, it's important to not only communicate um, to the employee, but it's to get communication from them. So empathize and be list and, and listen to them and be sincere. Um, if you're concerned, tell them you're concerned. Don't try and frighten them, but you want to be honest with them so that, so that you're believable. Um, it's okay to not, have, to not have all the answers. As I said in the beginning, nobody has all the answers. Um, and if you followed this from the very beginning, every day something new comes up. Every day some new fact about the disease or some new situation. So no one has all the answers. But what you want to do is reassure the employee about what you do know and also tell them that you will get back to them and try and find the answer for them and make sure you get back to them. Um, make it easy for sick or exposed employees to stay home. Um, sometimes people, I, I heard a story about a gentleman who was working for a, a small organization in Eastern PA, and his family said he, you know, he wasn't well, but he said, they need me at work. It's critical that I get there. I've got to go. And he went to work anyway. Well, it turned out that he actually had the disease and he ended up exposing other people in the workplace because he went to work, the loyal man he was. And unfortunately, he also passed away from the disease. So encourage people to stay at home and try and make it easy, as easy for them as you can if they are truly ill. Remind them about the benefits that are available to them. And if you can be generous and creative about those kind of things, try and do that. Again, Anything that you do for one employee may set a precedent, so you want to be careful about how generous you are, and you want to make sure that you can carry it out going forward for others. But um, try to be as flexible as you can be in this regard. Um, there's a website that I posted here, um, which is called, it's called the Academy, and there's a really good, um, there's some really good information for how to go remote overnight, how to prepare. Now, this was prior to the COVID pandemic, uh, really hit heavily and there was a lot of shutdowns, but it's a really good website to get some ideas about remote, dealing with remote work and remote workers. 
Um, one of the ways to keep in touch is through virtual conferencing. Um, and you can see here, there are many tools to do virtual conferencing. Um, right now we're using Zoom. Um, that's one. Uh, Zoom uh, at its lowest level is free um, for um, up to 40 minutes. Um, of use um, with, a, with a number of, connecting a number of people. Um, things like GoToMeeting, uh, Skype, some of these um, are, are free if you use their basic services, but they cost more if you, if you um, need more from them or you want to have more people involved. Um, Zoom, if it's only used between two people, has an unlimited amount of time. If you use it with a group of people, again, the basic service, you can only use it for 40 minutes and it will shut you off. You can buy a Zoom account and pay a monthly fee and it will be um, open to many more people. So again, I'm not supporting Zoom alone, but Cisco WebEx also has a basic free service. Um, there's also a new service on um, uh, that Microsoft is providing called Microsoft Teams. And it has an unlimited number of people, and I don't think it limits time. Um, and then there's things like uh, GoToMeeting, or um, I use Google Hangouts or Google Meets, and that again has a lot of flexibility. You can also use local media to communicate or to host um, uh, webcasts or information for your employees, and things like Facebook Live, Instagram, YouTube, LinkedIn, Twitter Live, all of those have streaming services too. So again, there's lots of options. Some of them cost money, some of them are free, but you wanna look into what would work best for you. Safety. Um, I said that we were gonna talk about safety because it's critically important right now if your business is open, your organization is open, and if you're thinking about going forward. So I thought I'd cover it under this first part. Um, you should have social distancing policies and practices. And if you're closed right now, you should be thinking about what they're going to be, what they will look like going forward. Uh, personal protective equipment. We've seen the term, the uh, the acronym PPE a lot lately. Um, what kind of a, what kind of personal protection are you going to provide for your employees? Uh, right now in Pennsylvania, if you have a business that's open, everyone in that, um, in that facility must wear a mask. And you as an employer are responsible for providing masks. Um, you can have employees get them themselves and you can pay them, but then you have to be careful about how you do that or it becomes taxable income if you give them money. So it's often better if you provide masks and they don't need to be, in most cases, unless you're in a medical uh, situation, they don't need to be um, N95 masks. You wanna make sure that you think about what, how you're cleaning and sanitizing your facility um, and how often. Um, you know, maybe your building was cleaned once every day or once a day at night. Now it should probably be cleaned more frequently. Um, some people are suggesting up to every two hours you should clean surfaces. Um, but, you know, again, you've got to look at what works best for you, and this is very customized. You want to minimize interaction. Think about if you're getting deliveries, um, that you have the um, UPS or the mail delivered to the doorstep rather than having individuals come into your building, um, potentially bringing uh, infection with them. If you keep them outside the building and you set it up so that you can pick it up off of the, um, the step or whatever, or you have some way um, of doing that, that's wise. Uh, promoting personal hygiene. We all know about how to wash hands. My, my four-year-old, almost four-year-old granddaughter can tell you exactly how to wash your hands. Um, if you get an alcohol-based rub, provide that for your employees. Good idea to have it throughout your, um, your facility. It should be at 60% or higher alcohol content. You should also have disinfectants, disposable towels or, or wipes um, so that people can clean their work surfaces. Um, in Pennsylvania, as I mentioned, workers are required to wear masks. The two links that you see here are um, access to the guidance for businesses 
and also a flyer that you're expected in Pennsylvania to be posting in your business if your business is opening, is open now, or reopening. I just became aware of these recently. The expectation is you have them up in your business where your employees and your visitors can see them. Um, if you're not aware of that, go to these sites. You can, find, you can find the flyer there. It's two pages and you have to have your executive sign in the bottom committing to keeping it a safe workplace. Um, the EPA has approved certain chemicals um, in their list N, if you go onto the EPA website, it will, it will um, identify chemicals, the best cleaning chemicals for eradicating the virus. Um, but you know, most, um, most heavy cleaning, most sanitizing uh, chemicals will work. Um, again, you wanna be careful about safety there because you're, if you're exposing your employees to heavy duty chemicals, that could be a hazard and that could violate OSHA laws. Um, finally, you want to encourage workers to report safety and health concerns because they're the people on the ground. They're the people that see things. If they have questions or concerns, you want to make sure they tell you before there's a problem. Uh, record keeping and documentation. Um, very important right now. If you have people working off-site, you need to maintain some kind of performance records, some kind of notes, so that down the road, if you make um, uh, promotion decisions, termination decisions, if you make even making decisions about who you might lay off later, it's important that you have good documentation about how well people are doing the job now. Um, you should also note any decisions related to changes in status. So when it comes to doing layoffs or callbacks or uh, furloughs or any kind of terminations and of course hiring, those things should be noted carefully in terms of, and they, you should always have good documentation, but it's even more important now because there's in all likelihood gonna be a lot of action um, on the legal side once this is over. And some individuals who feel that they haven't been treated fairly are gonna take action through either through government agencies or through attorneys and lawsuits. So the more accurate your information is, the more, information you keep on why you made decisions and good documentation, the safer you will keep your organization. Um, talked a little bit about the expanded family and medical leave. Um, and there's also the Employee Paid Leave Act. Um, both of these, um, uh, in both of these situations, you get some tax for forgiveness from the government for the coverage for the paid family and medical leave. So you have to pay the employees during their um, family and medical leave time. Normally FMLA is unpaid. In this case, you have to pay the employee um, or part of the act is two weeks of um, uh, uh, paid time off for sickness and then possible up to 10 weeks of family and medical leave. The employee is paid during this time period. That money comes directly from you, but you can deduct the cost of that from the taxes that you pay. So you're not, um, you're not putting out the money and getting reimbursed later, you're paying out to the employee and then getting, um, getting to reduce the taxes that you give to the government. Um, I'm not an expert on this, but certainly this website will provide you with more information if you're taking advantage or you have to do those. The Paycheck Protection Program, you've heard a lot about in the news. Um, very large amounts, billions of dollars were put into the program. The first run through um, provided loans for small businesses and in some cases for 501c3 nonprofits. Um, the money disappeared very quickly for the first part of the program. They put more money in and the second part, from what I understand, is somewhere around half gone by now. If you're interested in looking into getting these loans, these loans um, provide reimbursement. Or they're a loan that you have to take and they're a 1% loan. You have to sign up for a loan through a bank that's working with the Small Business Administration. Um, the loan will be forgiven if the money is used to pay employees 
or for payroll costs, 75% of it. Um, the other 25 can be used for other business expenses. And if you can prove that, the loan will be forgiven. You don't have to pay the loan payments right away. So it's a very low interest loan, even if you had to pay it back. But if you use it for the appropriate things, you get loan forgiveness. You don't have to pay it back at all. Now the trick here is your records. You wanna make sure that if you participate in these programs, you keep very, very good records about how you're using the money and the fact that you're employing people. If you are using this kind of a program and you shut down your business and laid people off, not because of a government order or um, because you didn't have the money to pay them, you can, you're expected to bring them back to work. You can't get this money and use it for anything um, except paying employees. So you bring them back on as employees, either working in your facility or you just pay them and they don't work, as long as you're using the money to pay them. The idea behind this was the federal government was looking for some relief for the unemployment system. So being lent this money to use for this reason and being forgiven allows you to keep people employed and then they are not on the unemployment rolls. Um, the CARES Act, uh, which is the, um, uh, involves a, an employee retention credit that's also um, part of this program. Again, accurate records for everything that you're doing right now are critical. Um, some other resources listed here, the Young Nonprofit Professionals Organization, the Allegheny Conference, the Arts Action Fund, the non Nonprofit HR, these are all links where you can get more, more information on it and help for your organization. Okay, now we're gonna move into future issues um, for our remaining time. Um, under this area, you wanna think about return or reopening. Um, even if you continue to operate, odds are you don't have anybody, or you don't have everybody working right now. So some of these things will apply to almost every employer. You wanna think about what your talent needs are now and going forward. Um, that's in terms of um, developing employees and helping them to grow into the kinds of needs you're gonna have because they're gonna be different because the world is gonna operate differently going forward. Um, and also if some people will leave your organization, I know of a couple of organizations who have lost people to retirements because they said they really don't wanna risk coming back to work. So they've retired early. So now you're gonna to need to replace them, and replace them most likely when things return to full activity. Um, you, the, uh, acquiring that talent, what are you gonna look for as you hire people going forward? You're probably gonna look for people who have different skill sets and talents than you needed before. And then finally, we'll talk a little bit about consolidations. Um, that's often a dirty word to small nonprofits, but it may be because of economic conditions that that's your best thought, either a temporary or permanent consolidation combining with other like organizations in order to have everybody survive. Um, returning and reopening, um, it should be done gradually, disciplined, and step-by-step. Step. You should actually write out a plan. If you are closed now or you're partially closed, how are you going to bring people back? Um, how how um, are you going to organize their workspaces? How are you going to have them work? Um, think about whatever restrictions short and long-term there might be. And again, if you go back to the information from the governor's office, there are three phases of reopening, um, yellow, red, and or red, yellow, and green. If you move into a yellow or a green phase, there may be some restrictions, even if the business can be, or the organization can be open. Again, physical spaces. How can you reorganize your space so that there's more distance between people? so people aren't stuffed in, there aren't four people stuffed into the same office space. Or if you have four people in the same office space, can you reorganize their schedules so there's only two of them there at a time or one at a time? How are you gonna sanitize? Um, how are you gonna deal with communal space? You know, conference rooms, if they still exist going forward for a while, are gonna have to be sparsely populated and well cleaned. And maybe you don't have conference rooms. Maybe you do 
Um, I have one organization I've worked with that does a Zoom webcast, even when people are in the office, rather than having them leave and get, get in a communal space together. Um, I'm not gonna talk a lot about scanning temperature. That is something that you can do to try and identify people who might be ill as they come back into the workplace. There are some risks with um, taking temperatures, and those risks mainly involve um, keeping the information confidential, and also are you exposing the person who's doing the temperature taking? Um, can they stand six feet away? I don't know how well these scanners work, but I'm not sure that they can. So you don't want to risk the individuals that are taking the temperatures. You want to protect confidentiality. So you don't want to announce in front of everybody that Phyllis has a fever this morning, so we're sending her home. Because she might be infected, but she might not be. There may be some other reason for her fever. And again, that's privacy and that's covered by HIPAA law. So temperature scanning may be okay to do and you may want to consider it, but research it thoroughly. Um, there's other ways of asking people about their health, encouraging them to stay home, asking them about whether they're feeling well. Um, there are questions that you can ask, which ordinarily might have been kind of taboo questions under the Americans with Disabilities Act. There's some leeway allowed now, but again, don't start doing those without looking for more info. Um, Work schedules, again, you can change schedules so that people aren't there all the time. Uh, some businesses that are currently operated, operating that I'm affiliated with have half the, um, half the employees come in on um, every other day. Uh, another business has half the employees working from home one week, the other group working at the office, and then they switch for the next week. So they're reducing the number of individuals, which reduces the chances for infection. Um, working from home and teleconferencing, we've talked about. You may want to look at revising your leave policies. Can you be more generous with your leave policies? Can you allow people to dip into paid time off that they would get, be getting in the future um, rather than not allowing them to take the time off now? Because again, if you try to force people to come to work and they are ill, you're risking infection of them and other people. Um, you might want to consider allowing changes to vacations. People may have scheduled vacations for this year and find that because of the COVID epidemic, they're not going to be able to use their vacation time. Allowing to make changes to that or allowing them to use that time as um, sick time or something like that or move it into the following year. Think about what can you change to make it better for your employees and not to penalize them when they have no control over the COVID. Um, I talked a little bit about talent needs. You want to make sure that you have the right kinds of skills and knowledge going forward. Think about what's different between the knowledge, skills, and competencies that you need now and the, or that you needed in the past and you're going to need going forward. Think about transferable skills. I'm sure some of you have already um, discovered this, where you can't have everybody come to work um, and you have to have people taking over some responsibilities they wouldn't ordinarily have. So how can you make sure going forward that you've cross-trained more individuals in the organization so there's more backup if you can't have everybody there? Um, there's a, a, a philosophy called distributed authority. Um, this is a situation where there isn't just one person that makes all the decisions or one person in charge. If that one person um, is, is sick or, uh, God forbid, dies of COVID, Who's going, to make, who's going to make the decisions? Again, in small nonprofits, um, we've been talking about succession planning through the Bayer Center for a couple of years now. Now is the time to really think about it because if you don't have somebody who can step in and the executive director gets sick and doesn't come back, who's going to take over? How are you going to provide for the continuation of the organization? And teaching people about dis distance management, developing leadership skills, and developing your technical and digital knowledge. Um, again, many of us have gotten away without developing a lot of technical competence for years. Um, I actually have a for-profit business that discovered 
um, they were being, they're being audited for a wage and hour audit, and they were asked to provide all their records for the last two years of employee work hours, and they still use paper timesheets. And so now they're having difficulty in providing that information. Maybe now is the time to think about how can we become more technically competent. Think about getting people and keeping people who are flexible, creative, adaptable, and adaptable versus just experienced, okay? If that experience has allowed them to develop those competencies, great. But if the experience means that they think there's only one way to do something, you may wanna think about how to try and get them to change or how to find individuals that uh, to work for you that are more flexible. And then again, think about replacement and succession plans. And replacement plans are those plans where you know who will take over tomorrow if the boss is sick. Succession plans are who's gonna take over when the boss retires. So they're more long-term, but you gotta have both in place and certainly replacement plans right now. Um, employee development, plan now um, to fill those gaps in talent um, with training. Um, online and interactive opportunities are all over the place. Train people on how to learn online. Um, many of our high school students are just learning how to do that, even their elementary school students. There are techniques to best learn and teach online. Start exploring that for your organizations and explore free training. There's not a lot of free resources and money right now. So look into things where you can get some free training. Khan Academy is, is free. Uh, Coursera is a website that provides all kinds of um, courses, including college level courses that aren't necessarily free, but they're very inexpensive. They're not college credit cost. Um, and then vendors often provide free training programs. Right now, every law firm I know is providing a free training programs to anybody on the aspects of the um, legal issues related to the COVID pandemic. So look for things that are inexpensive or free. Don't use the excuse, we don't have the money. Um, include career planning for your employees. Again, you're looking at succession and development and try to think about what kind of mentoring and coaching you can do going forward um, as you get people back to work and you find that they need new skills. Um, finding people, think about your needs for the future. One of the things that nonprofits have going for them is the fact that we make a difference in the world. That's why I like being involved with nonprofits. That's why I've worked for them in the past. We make a difference. Your organizations, you make a difference in the world. So make sure that you clearly identify your social impact. That will help you hire going forward. Um, there's a lot of unemployment now, and there's probably a lot of small businesses, including some nonprofits that will fail. That doesn't mean that the most qualified best employees are gonna be easier to get necessarily because people are gonna want them even more. So you have to look best. And one of the things that everybody's excited about now or interested in is helping others. So now use that to develop your talent brand. Um, identify what you're gonna pay. Uh, if you can provide flexible work, that's, that's something, again, most people are still looking for. Beyond pay, they want flexibility. Now is the time to think flexibility. Partner with others. Think about employees, contractors, or gig workers. You don't have to have full-time employees for every, every job or every position. And update your sourcing methods. Start thinking about using social media and make it easy to apply for jobs in your organization. Now is the time to think about this before you need to start hiring. And make sure, of course, that you follow up with anybody that applies for a job with you, whether you decide to go forward with them or not. You don't have to tell them why you haven't chosen them, but you at least um, an email or a, a quick communication saying we've moved on with somebody else is really builds your rep reputation as a good organization. Um, collaborations, consolidations, um, uh, you know, are really, really important right now. And I noticed I collaborated twice there. Um, typically, we don't want to consider um, 
consolidations as much as we are interested in considering collaborations. Um, this website that I have noted has some good information on continuity and recovery plans. This might be the best time to think about who else has the same needs or complementary needs and services and skills to your organization. If things are tough, sometimes working together makes it easier. Look for organizational synergies for consolidations. You might have to make adjustments to staff. Maybe you're reducing your staff. Maybe somebody else can use that staff. Maybe you need more people and somebody has to lay people off. Um, think about facilities. Do you have a lot of redundant or duplicate facilities when it comes to you and other providers? Is there a way to combine so that you can reduce the cost? Because again, if we think about going forward, it's gonna cost us more to take care of those facilities because we have to work harder to keep them clean. And in all likelihood, it's gonna be a year or longer, maybe two years before we can back off of doing a lot of those kinds of sanitizations and cleaning things. Um, that's gonna cost money and the bigger space you have, the more it's gonna cost you to keep it clean. Is there a way to reduce the amount of space that you have to use, potentially reducing cost? And can you make that facility available to somebody else? And then synergies when it comes to boards. Um, can your board work with other boards to try and strategize uh, business continuation? Also think about things outside your normal wheelhouse. Um, I've been listening to the Pittsburgh Tech Council has had a series of great uh, lunchtime programs about how to deal with COVID and what people are doing. And at the end of every program, um, uh, Audrey says, what can we do for you? When she was talking to the, uh, the um, community health uh, or the community food bank people, she said, what can we in technology do for you to help you be successful and continue your good work? So, Organizations like the Tech Council are looking for ways that their people who are involved with technology can help nonprofits. Most nonprofits need help with technology, so now is the time to reach out to organizations like that because they are willing and able to help you. Um, and look for for profits that are interested in community involvement to collaborate with you and to help you going forward. This is my contact information. Um, it does say Freedom, Pennsylvania, but I'm just, I, I'm really in Cranberry. Um, this is my website and my email address. Please don't hesitate to get in touch if you have questions going forward. Um, and I, Carrie, do we have any questions right now that we could answer? We've got about five minutes left. Sure thing. Um, let's see, there was a question about tech, the tax credits. Are nonprofits eligible for the tax credits on, on payroll taxes? Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know the details on that. That's something you would have to look for. I know that they originally some of the um, programs were not available to nonprofits, and then they've made some changes in them. And I know that there's a push to change some more of them. So. Um, check out the websites that I mentioned or um, get in touch and maybe I can point you in the right direction. And um, what you can do is to help by communicating with your legislators. Um, they're the people out there that are um, uh, helping to develop these regulations and um, reach out to them and say, look, nonprofits are critical for our infrastructure and we need help too. But there are some that are available and there are some that are being made available. And you might have some influence by um, reaching out and communicating with them. I know that the Large Arts Organization has done that. I know the Society for Human Resource Management has done it because all of their chapters and state councils, um, hundreds of them throughout the country are all nonprofit organizations. And they are hurting too, because all the programs that brought them money are, are not being done, or if they are, they're being minimized. So um, I think we will see more help, but I'm not sure. I can't, I don't know enough to be that specific right now. 
We have another question about how to handle a situation where um, what if an employee refuses return to work due, due to being scared of that this will happen again? Um, I know you can reassure, reassure them of the safety you have in place, but what if they're still not willing to return? That's a real tough one. But I've seen that asked over and over again. In fact, I've had some clients call me about that. Um, it's very difficult and it's a real case by case kind of thing. Um, it's possible, and I say possible because I'm not a lawyer and I don't know for sure, that the Americans with Disabilities Act might kick in in that case or that possibly traditional family and medical leave might kick in if you have over 50 employees. One way to get more information about the situation and whether ADA applies would be to call the Job Accommodation Network. It's J-A-N dot O-R-G. If you look on their website, there's phone numbers. There's actually, it's actually quicker to get them through a, a live chat or an email. But the Job Accommodation Network can help you sift through whether this person qualifies under the Americans with Disabilities Act for some kind of an accommodation. If they don't, and they don't qualify under family and medical leave because a doctor says they shouldn't be coming to work, you know, maybe they have anxiety disorder and the doctor says, well, they should be given flexibility. Those are, are conditions where you might be able to, um, they might qualify for protection under those um, laws. Um, the other thing is just try and do what Carrie said, try and reassure them about the safety, um, if there's any way to provide them with remote work or with some kind of a different schedule so they aren't exposed to a lot of people in the workplace, again, even if you wouldn't ordinarily do that, think about being flexible. I mean, ultimately, if they won't come to work and you have no way to protection and you can't protect them and you can't afford to keep them employed if they're not doing the job, you may have to tell them maybe this isn't the job for them, which is very unfortunate. But um, I guess the semi-good news is they could collect unemployment for a while. Um, but, you know, it, it's a difficult situation, and I don't blame them. I mean, you know, I might be afraid to go back, too, if I were under those circumstances. I'm in a uh, protected group. I'm, I'm, you know, over 65, um, and I don't want to be in big crowds. Um, I'm lucky I have the option of not doing that in my work. But I guess just work with the person and try and do the best you can and check into whether they qualify under family and medical leave if you have 50 or more employees, or if they um, might be covered under the Americans with Disabilities Act. But you know, it may be that you can provide them with some accommodation, but that may not be an un unending time frame of not coming to work. So again, be creative, I guess. Well, we have, there are a few more questions, and I would encourage anyone who didn't get their question answered to reach out to Phyllis directly. Her contact information is here on the PowerPoint, and Shelby will send everyone the PowerPoint who was on the call today. I did take attendance, so that's great. Um, but I just want to thank you all for being here, but especially I want to thank Phyllis, a uh, good friend of mine, like I said, one of my favorite people. Uh, Thank you for taking the time for uh, spending an hour uh, with your expertise and your knowledge today. It was um, really wonderful. So thank you all for coming. Um, if you'd like a copy of this webinar, um, reach out to me directly. Richards C. I'm Carrie Richards, Richards C at rmu.edu. We need about a day for um, Zoom to process the video. We need to make sure that um, it's in good shape to go. So, but please reach out to me if you want a copy of this and you'll all get a copy of the PowerPoint. Thank you so much, Phyllis, and thank you all for being here today. We really appreciate it.